Good afternoon. If you're like me, you wake up every morning and you look at your phone. I typically go through the news to give a sense of where the world is going, to give a sense of place. And it feels like the whole place is unraveling right now. And over the course of the past few weeks, one subject that has bubbled up to the surface of these conversations is the age of our collective societies. The New York Times ran a full series of essays in their opinion section just a few weeks ago. We're talking now about the pressures that an aging population puts on our economies, but also our healthcare systems. All of a sudden, it seems that aging society has captured the public's attention in the way that climate change has. And there's a reason for that. These two periods of change are actually sisters. Sisters, you say? They're sisters because they grew up together. They're byproducts of the industrial revolutions that have changed the face of the world over the past 250 years. I would argue, though, that we are probably in the most disruptive demographic period the world has experienced since the end of the Second World War, where we experienced a massive population explosion known as the baby boom. This period of change is unlike any other in human history because it is largely driven by two dynamics that we've never experienced before. The first and foremost is we have lower birth rates. Birth rates are down in every country on the planet. There isn't a single country that is immune from this. The lowest birth rate in the world is in South Korea at 0.78. The highest birth rate in the world is Niger at 6.78. But guess what? All birth rates are declining. You cannot get away from it. At the same time, as John emphasized, we're seeing increased longevity. This is happening in nearly every country on the planet, with the exception of the United States. The United States longevity numbers are dropping. They are dropping primarily because we cannot keep kids safe. The primary driver that's lowering US mortality right now, or increasing US mortality rather, don't wanna get that one wrong, are gun deaths but also suicides, automobile accidents, et cetera. Our longevity, built mostly over the 20th century, following the second industrial revolution, was driven by trying to keep kids healthy. When my grandfather was born in 1914, he had a one in two chance of surviving into adulthood. Today, it's over 90%. That is a great human success story. But during the same period of time, we started having fewer babies a lot fewer babies. And whoever brought their baby today, God bless you for having one. <laughs> but at the same time, we've got a lot more older adults, more than we've ever experienced before in the history of mankind. So while we're at historically low birth rates and they continue to decrease, for the most part, longevity continues to increase too. And you'll hear this stat probably a thousand times over today, but guess what the fastest growing demographic in the world is? people over the age of 85. These are the people that typically take up the most bandwidth in our healthcare systems and typically have the least digital literacy. So when we think about the tools that we're going to develop for this burgeoning aging population, we have to think about a number of different dynamics that come together to create this reality because the only solution cannot be digital. A lot of this has to be analog. One of the primary points that is often missed when we talk about demographic change is the shift in the pyramid. For a long period of time, we had a population pyramid with lots of young people at the bottom, very few people at the top, and everything worked as a result of it. We had a lot of tax-paying citizens that could pay for a very small group of people to survive into, adult, into adulthood and into old age. It was affordable to do this. It made sense during the middle century to move workers out of the workplace at 65 and into retirement because we had so many people around. In fact, a glut of labor 
growing from 2 billion people in the 1920s to 8 billion people today, that it was cheaper to get people out than to keep people in. But this creates a problem specifically for our healthcare sector because there were 76 million baby boomers born between 1946 and 1964 in the United States. There were only 69 million Generation Z born. So even if we're doing a one-to-one -one ratio, that means one, one individual Gen Z needs to take care of one boomer. Obviously, that's not exactly how the math is done, but it puts a fine point on the challenge ahead of us. Believe it or not, Generation Alpha following Gen Z is going to be even smaller. By mid-century, based on my projections, the world population stops growing. If you take a look at the UN and you believe their numbers, they're a lot more conservative, they say 2086. Regardless, for at least half the room, we are likely to see the world's population stop growing. Now, this is not delivered evenly across the world. It's certainly not delivered evenly across the United States. By the end of this decade, the United States hits super age. And super age, by definition, is where at least one out of five people, or 20% of the population, is over the age of 65. This map, which was put out by uh, the US Census Bureau, looks at census tracts across the United States. Take a look at the darkest areas. That's where the median age of the population is 50 or above. Most of this is occurring in rural areas, not urban ones. So these areas that are most at threat for demographic change are also experiencing threat against their own healthcare systems. They're experiencing threat against their way of life. They're largely disconnected from the rest of us. And it presents the greatest challenge because not only are these places older, all of the diseases of old age are found in higher numbers as a percentage than in big cities. We work for an organization uh, in the Midwest, a new innovation center called the DeWolf Center for Aging, uh, DeWolf Innovation Center for Aging and Dementia. And we proposed to them earlier this year that we do a map. We take a map look at the Midwest. We map it out for them. We find where are the highest concentrations of 65 plus populations by five year age groups. And let's figure out from there, just to confirm our theories, where the most people with dementia are as a percentage of the population. They are all in rural areas. They are all in rural areas, areas that do not have a health infrastructure anymore. But it's not just about the aging of the population. We're also dealing with depopulation in some countries. China last year, based on their official statistics, lost 850,000 people last year. We know those numbers are off by about 5 to 10x. We know that. We're sure of it. But let's just pretend the numbers are right. That's the city of San Francisco, wiped off the map. No positive migration into China, lots of people leaving, and an incredibly low birth rate that, based on government, uh, government official statistics, says is at or just around that of South Korea's. So China is in a unique demographic situation. John highlighted Japan. It's important to know Japan because they've been in this period since about 2014. They've lost 3.1 million people. Russia, even worse, since 1992, has lost 4.3 million people. Those numbers tick up exponentially every day, largely because of outward migration and the war in Ukraine. So these pressures aren't limited to the United States. They're not limited to the West. They are everywhere right now. And we, of course, we need to look at new solutions because there are problems coming without change. The biggest one being the economy. Too many people out of work, too few in work, creates a drag on the economy. It threatens things like social welfare programs, certainly healthcare systems, which are largely driven on human labor to deliver services. And rural and suburban communities, which are largely older now, face even greater threats because they don't have a younger population to serve them. In many cases, rural populations are not only seeing the erasure of decades of wealth creation through their real estate that now has no value, um, but they no longer have the services in place to really take care of them in old age, the things that we anticipated 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago when they were young people. Those no longer sit there directly in the community. 
We have a tight labor market. This is a direct result of demographic change. So everything that you've heard about quiet quitting, the great resignation, all of this, including inflation, is largely driven by the fact that the numbers are off. Our working age population between today and 2023 only grows by 2.3% in the United States. I'm using US figures here. But the 65 plus population grows by 23.6%. So substantially larger. Here's the real rub. The 16 to 24 is dropped by 7.5%. These are the people that are doing frontline work, low income wage type jobs, entry level jobs. They no longer exist or they start to erode. At the same time, the 75 plus workforce is projected to grow by nearly 100%. So change is afoot. But there are pain points on the average worker in this country. In fact, many workers worldwide. They've seen increases in the cost of nearly every single part of their work. And now they're starting to organize. We're starting to see people coming together and ask more from their employers. The GM strike right now, the Hollywood strike, are perfect examples of collective action. And in fact, we have really the perfect storm for collective action across labor markets in this country, with some sectors hit even harder, including healthcare. So now we're gonna have workers asking for more, which is going to raise their salaries and is going to reflect in the increase of healthcare costs across the board. This doesn't go away anytime soon. This at bare minimum is a decades long challenge, if not a two decades long challenge. So the solutions that we need are, are, have to come relatively fast and furious. Just some statistics so people have them as a baseline here. In the US, healthcare costs, costs have grown absolutely exponentially. Uh, there's no signal that they're going to slow down. In fact, coming out of COVID, we thought they had plateaued for a bit. They've gone through the roof. The only exception to this, and we're still trying to figure it out, um, mine's far better than mine, um, how Medicare spending is relatively leveled out, our public spending for 65 plus. We're still curious as to why that's happened because the projections were that that program would essentially be bankrupted in the 2030s. Um, we're also seeing, as a result of this increase in healthcare costs, more and more individuals taking on caregiving roles. How many people in this room have been a parent? Okay, more than half. How many of you have taken care of an adult parent? At least half of the room. You're the norm now. You're becoming the norm now. So this is impacting the labor market, but it's also because the healthcare costs are just too darn high. People can't afford to put family members into nursing or 24-hour care like they used to. This also potentially can cause a drag on the economy overall, something that's often overlooked in the conversation. But of course, the last point, and you probably are picking this up for my own passion, please, rural America and rural counties are a really significant missing piece of the puzzle. And if we're able to solve for these areas, we'll be able to solve for nearly all the challenges in urban ones. But guess what? Every center on longevity, every future focused innovation center that talks about aging is either attached to a major university or a major funding source within an urban area. There are next to zero in rural areas. There's one in Louisville now, and there's one in Cedar Rapids, which I'm working with. But if we are able to solve for these populations, we solve for everyone. Because of the pressures of the healthcare system, because of the pressures on the economy, they are changing the nature of family life in this country as well. Since about the 1970s, we've seen a larger number of people moving into multi-generational homes. Today, about 18% of Americans live in a multi-generational setting. They're not doing this because they want to. No one really wants to live with mom and dad necessarily. No one really wants to live with all the grandkids, the great grandkids, associated relatives, but the economy is pushing them in this direction. Because if you take a look at any trend map since 1965 
American wage growth, and I'm just sticking to American statistics here, American wage growth has remained relatively static, relatively sluggish growth. But if you take a look at any other indicator for cost of living, housing, healthcare, education, long-term care, they have gone through the roof. So Americans, and frankly, most people around the world, are having to do more with less. How do you solve for that? Well, you bundle. You bundle. At the same time, because of this increased longevity, and to some degree, people living at home longer with their parents or their grandparents, they're delaying the onset of other life course markers. They're pushing marriage later. They're pushing home ownership later. They're pushing having children later, which is pushing more people to remain as singles. So now we have this other growing group of individuals, 14% of the population, that live in single households. Single households are more a threat for economic challenges, healthcare challenges, than their multi generational peers. Oftentimes, the practice of doing strategic foresight, which is the core of my work and a real big focus of the Super Age, my book, is that we have to take a look at previous historic examples that give us a sense of what the future is going to take us. Right here, right now, we have similar demographics to the post-war period without the baby boom. Post-war America, one out of two men over the age of 65 was engaged in the formal labor market. By the 1990s, it was only one out of eight. Today, it's about one out of five, approaching one out of four in this country. We will see, as we're seeing in Hollywood, as we're seeing in Detroit, big business bend to the asks of the workers, perhaps closing the wealth gap, perhaps for a longer period of time. But the demands that these businesses, these, these individual people are making within their collective unions, these demands are for the basics. Cover my health care, cover my needs in retirement. These are the same requests they made in the mid-century that they got. And of course, we're seeing a switch in terms of housing, family, and community structure. If you're unaware of the research that came out just last week, uh, about 45% of American young people ages 18 to 29 are living at home with mom and dad. The only period where it was higher was during the COVID years where it tipped above 50%. We knew that was gonna be a blip because of the reality of that situation. However, this mimics almost identically what happened during the war years with a majority of children living at home with their family. So we can take some of this past and take a look at it and say, okay, well, how does that plug into the future? How does that plug into where we're going? The future is already here. So we take some of these pieces of the past, we line them up with some of the things that might be coming in the coming years, and we can say, okay, we can make technology enhance life. We don't necessarily need to take mom and dad to the doctor anymore. We don't have to physically drive them there. The doctor can come to them now. Well, guess what that is? That's a riff on the country doctor showing up in your home with their bag in hand. And as we build out more technologies that can actually measure people's health metrics, we're going to see that become far more normalized than driving 15, 20 minutes, multiple hours to get to a healthcare center. In fact, uh, you'll also see a driver, um, specifically in tech, and I think Bill Gates has, was, was promoting this last week, around maternal health, where you can get a, uh, um, a device to, to actually check the health of the baby um, into the community, attaches to a mobile phone, and the local doula uh, can assess whether or not that person needs to go to a hospital for care or can stay in the community and give birth, thus reducing the overall costs on the healthcare system. We have to leverage inclusive design to improve space across the board. Um, this will improve health as a result. Not just accessible design, inclusive design. People don't just need a ramp. They need the right lighting. They need the right paint colors on the wall. They need the right fabrics. They need to be able to get in and out of these chairs. Health and scientific interventions are also coming at us fast and furious, and these will help extend the lifespan but if I say it once, I say it a thousand times, healthy longevity starts from day one. In fact, it may even start before that in utero. So these investments need to happen over time 
analog and digital. And in closing, a couple calls to action here. We have to have a global demographic disruption heat map in place. I've done the analysis domestically. We need this globally in order to understand where are the biggest pain points, where are the biggest pressure points affecting our societies today. From there, we can focus on how to do high-speed internet deployment in these areas to ensure that digital technologies connect them to the rest of the world. Not only will this sustain these local communities longer term, bringing modernity to them, but it also can reduce healthcare costs overall. And in a recent analysis, analysis by the Government Accountability Office, they said it'll take $53,000 per household on the indigenous lands to deliver high-speed internet access. Guess what? That's a good investment at the end of the day. Finally, don't just invest in technology access, but in, also invest in technology matching platforms, understand what pe tech people are willing to use, and gosh darn it, invest in literacy programs. And if I can give one shout out to my ARP colleagues, my former ARP colleagues, their OATS program is a great start to this. We need more of these in the community where people can actually understand the technology that they use. On that, thank you very much. John, it's good to be here, and thank you to our hosts.